thrilled to have the opportunity to talk with all of you today. My one-year-old daughter might be a little less thrilled, so if you hear a refrain of mama coming from the, the back, we're going to all pretend it's not happening. <laughs> my husband has a brilliant idea of bringing her to my talk. Um, so something that's come up over and over in the course of the talks today is how amazing it is that over a hundred years of research at the NBC, researchers have remained remarkably faithful to a paradigm that really embraces natural history. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is what I think is likely to happen as that paradigm comes confronted with some changes in our field that are likely to revolutionize the field of biology. Particularly, I'll be talking about the field of genomics, or the study of organisms' genomes. So on the one hand, we have a paradigm that embraces natural history, and on the other hand, we have a paradigm that's increasingly mechanistic and increasingly reductionist. And I wouldn't be here talking to you today if I didn't think that there was a compelling case to be made, not only for integrating these perspectives, but for actually both um, shedding new light for the other. Now, using genetic tools is not new in biology, and certainly not in the MBZ, where people have been using molecular methods for decades now. But what is new is the radical scale at which we're now acquiring and analyzing genetic and genomic data. That's made clear on these graphs, which are actually on the log scale, so it's a much more dramatic trend than, than it looks like visually. You see that the cost of sequencing has been declining, and the capacity of the machines that do the sequencing has been increasing. What this means is that we are ending up with an exponential increase in the amount of sequence data that's available in public domains, like uh, the GenBank database. I'm just showing you here the billions of base pairs that are currently in GenBank. And I wanted to layer on top of this graph a little bit of my own history to, have, um, to give you a sense that the field of genomics is like, likely to impact not only biology as a whole, but also the individual research programs of a large number of people in this room. So the first year that I was in uh, university level lab was 1994. I was in an absolutely cutting edge molecular evolution fruit fly genetics lab, and I evaluated patterns of variation at one locus. <laughs> the same was true my first year as a grad student in the MBZ. I was very proud of myself for sequencing the mitochondrial gene ND4 in about 20 individuals. But things changed really dramatically by the time I left the MBZ. In 2004, I looked at patterns of variation at upwards of 100 loci, and this required an enormous amount of blood, sweat, and tears in 2005, and actually still does in a lot of cases. So contrast that to the data that, that I collected in 2007, where I'm looking at patterns of variation at over 60,000 genes. Routinely, and I actually left them in my bag, but uh, well, I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. So, um, so I just tell you that about my own history to give you a sense that uh, that this kind of research is not necessarily for people that were born with genomic spoons in their mouths. It's something that is required and actually radically changes the kind of work that we're able to do. So, for those of you less familiar with genomics, I'll just give you a very brief introduction to the kind of tools that we use. One is comparative genomics, where we're interested in using actual nucleotide sequence data compared across taxa to understand something about genome evolution or genome architecture. The second, which I'll talk more about today, is functional genomics. And what I mean by that is the study of gene expression patterns. So only a small proportion of the genome is actively being transcribed into RNA in any given tissue at any given time point. And we're interested in the transcribed genome because that's what's going to ultimately generate proteins that are going to have an influence on organismal phenotypes, physiology, etc. So how do we study gene expression? Well, we can create customized probes that match regions of the genome all throughout the genome and then have these synthesized onto a gene expression 
um, array or a gene chip, as Craig calls them. Um, I brought actually some of them, which I meant to have up here. Uh, they look like old fashioned glass slides, but the thing that's amazing is that between your thumb and forefinger, you can literally hold the tools to look at patterns of gene expression at every single genome, every single gene in an organism's genome. What this enables is doing <coughs> experiments like the following, where we might take two samples that we're interested in contrasting, label them with two different colored dyes, hybridize these to an array, and then evaluate the comparison between the intensity of fluorescence at different spots on the array. So basically, you'll notice from this um, array uh, image that there's four different colors. There's black or yellow spots when the two different samples are hybridizing equally to the array, either because the probes aren't binding to either sample and they're black, or both samples are expressed and they're yellow. But what we're really interested in are the green and red spots. And here I have to apologize to Dave, who is always uh, very uh, concerned about colorblind people. And I'm sorry, but it's not my fault. But this is actually the colors of the array of data. So uh, if you're colorblind, there's green and red spots. And it doesn't matter actually which color they are, because the point is the same. These are the genes we care about because they're what I call differentially expressed. And you'll hear that a lot in the course of my talk. It means that there's some difference in the expression pattern between those genes, and those are interesting candidates then for further evaluation to try to understand what's different between our samples on a higher level. So, one criticism that can be levied against this kind of approach is that it's just a fishing expedition and we have actually no idea what we're looking for, and so why is it interesting? And I think that there's two compelling reasons why this is not a problem. The first is that the assays I'll describe to you today are whole genome assays. So I'm sampling every single gene in an organism's genome. And what that means is I'm not introducing any bias about choosing a small subset of the genome that I think might be interesting for some reason or another. I actually think that Ronell would appreciate this kind of approach, and I think of it in some ways as natural history phase of genomics research. It's perfectly appropriate to have a stage of research where you're understanding the lay, of, the lay of the land and taking a more descriptive approach. What this then enables, though, is much more targeted follow-up studies where we can go and take particular genes or particular pathways and study them in much more detail. So the system that I'm applying these tools to is that of amphibian declines. Certainly everyone in this room knows that amphibians around the world are experiencing massive population losses. And although this is due to a number of different factors, the chytrid fungus, the Trachochytrium dendrobatidis, or BD as I'll call it today, is responsible for many of the catastrophic declines of amphibians around the world. This is just one example, a picture that Van Greenberg <coughs> took in the Sierra Nevadas. And I just want to give you a very short background about chytrid, since many of you might not um, have that much experience with, uh, with BD. Uh, chytrids are a basal fungus, so they're actually of great interest not only because um, some of them are vertebrate pathogens, but also because they have a lot to tell us about very deep branches on the tree of life. This particular chytrid has an interesting life cycle where it has these motile zoospores that are pre-living, and then they find a substrate to insist on, um, in our case amphibian skin, and then they'll insist and go through the development of these sporangia, which develop and release new zoospores. Those zoospores can then either turn around and reinfect the same host or go back into the water column. BP is responsible for uh, hundreds, uh, it, it has been found in hundreds of species around the world. This map is already a few years out of date, so these numbers are much larger. And I thought that this would be a really excellent opportunity to try to apply genomic tools to an ecologically relevant system because despite the last 10 years of ecological research on BD since it was described in 1999, we actually know very little about the mechanistic way that BD is killing frogs. The problem, of course, is that we don't know anything about the genomes of any of the frogs that are experiencing declines in the wild. So the approach that I'll describe to you today starts and only starts with using a model system that's Xenopus for which we have the whole genome. 
In the last couple of years, I've been fortunate to be involved in sequencing the whole genome of the Kitcher BD as well. And so we have the opportunity here to integrate research from both the host and the pathogen's point of view. Ultimately, what we want to do, though, is push, push this work back out into the field. And I'll just tell you at the very end of my talk a little bit about work that I'm starting <laughs> on in collaboration with a, a number of folks in uh, Rana Muscosa at the Mount Yale Lake So let's start with BD. As I mentioned, BD has this life cycle that you can divide into kind of two main categories. One is a host-independent phase, where the, there are three swimming zoospores. And one is a host-dependent phase, where the zoospores must insist in something in order to undergo the rest of their life cycle. This presented an opportunity, I thought, to understand what some of the genes are that govern the differences in these life stages. And we'd be interested in understanding what genes might be responsible for zoospore motility and chemotaxis. And we'd be interested in understanding the genes that are responsible for the host-dependent phase of the life cycle, because those would be good candidates for pathogenicity factors. <coughs> So this is similar to the mock example I showed, but it's, it's the experimental design for this first experiment comparing zoospores and sporangia. And these are some actual data, but not in a simple linear format I showed you before. This is what I call a volcano plot. And what it shows us on the x-axis is the expression change in multiples. So over here what you see are probes or genes that are six times more highly expressed on the log scale in sporangia than they are in zoospores. And on the y-axis, I've simplified the statistics. If you're interested, we can talk about that later, just to let you know that there are statistics that are very necessary for this kind of work, and that allow us to take thousands and thousands of genes and, and identify statistically which ones show differential expression. So here I'm showing you the differentially expressed gene set in the zoospores and in the sporangia, and the first thing you're probably noticing is that this is not a symmetrical um, plot. And I wanted to use this to make the point that even at a very abstract level with this genomic data, we start to learn important things about organismal biology. So what this suggested to me is that the transcriptional profile of sporangia is much more complex than that of zoospores. And in digging a little bit into the literature, it turns out that many flagellated sperm-like life stages actually don't do a lot of de novo transcription. They're kind of comfortable with transcripts and go out for their very short life and just do their thing. And this is actually supported if we look at what some of the genes in these categories are. In the zoospore sample, we see enrichment for genes that are involved in post-translational protein modification, which is consistent with this idea that zoospores might be transcribing very little, which is modifying the transcripts that are already available. And in sporangia, we see a whole lot of genes involved in various aspects of metabolism. And these are really interesting targets for our spearfishing because we're trying to figure out what exactly in frog skin chytrid is able to metabolize. And as we grow chytrid in different conditions and continue with these kinds of experiments, genes in this set are likely to provide some insight into, into more mechanistic aspects of post pathogen interaction. So I want to tell you just a couple of snippets about specific genes in these differentially expressed categories with the understanding that there are only a couple of small stories. Obviously, there's hundreds of genes um, that we're looking into. But one category of genes that I was very interested in is are these genes that are shared between chytrids and animals because they are likely to provide some candidate genes for flagellar function. And in fact, there's a number of genes that we find in the chytrid genome that are, 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 have orthologs in animals, these are sea urchin sperm, um, but that are absent in all other fungi that don't have flagella. And in fact, some of these genes are differentially expressed between life stages. And counterintuitively, they're more highly expressed in sporangia. So again, a simple directional result that all of a sudden changes the way we think about BD biology. Because what's important here is that sporangia are producing zoospores. And so that might be the life stage that we're interested in as far as understanding genes involved in flagellar development, not the actual life stage that's doing the swimming. Probably the most exciting result that's coming out of my BD work so far is by comparing BD to other fungal pathogens and trying to understand what might be some conserved proteins that are involved in fungal pathogenicity. 
And the most interesting is this gene um, family called fungaliasin metallopeptidases, which are known to be involved in keratin degradation and pathogenicity in another group of pathogenic fungi, the dermatophytes, which are responsible for human ailments such as ringworm. And these pictures give you an idea why I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night in a cold sweat thinking about having been bathing in chytrid for the last three years. Um, but the thing that's interesting about these fungaliasins uh, I'm showing you here a tree of relatedness of all of the copies of fungalizing metallopeptidases in the Kitcher genome. And there's a couple of really interesting things about this tree. First of all, it's a tree. So there's been duplications of the fungaliasins on the lineage leading to BD. If you look at other fungal genomes, there's only one or two copies, max, of these genes. So the expansion itself tells us that this gene family is likely really important in Kitcher biology. The second thing is to notice that the, the, all the genes with arrows show differential expression when we compare life stages. And so the second thing I want you to notice is that that's most of the genes. So most of the genes in this expansion are doing something different between life stages. Most of them show higher levels of expression in sporangia. Those are the ones indicated as orange arrows. So again, this directs renewed attention on sporangia as a life stage to understand as far as understanding how BD is actually attacking frog skin. And these are obviously really interesting candidates since they're known to be involved in keratin degradation. Finally, I just want to highlight these two genes with blue arrows. Those are two genes that show higher levels of expression in zoospores. <coughs> And so those all of a sudden become really compelling candidates for understanding the very initial stages of zoospore attacking frog skin and gaining entry into host cells. So what I've told you from the kindred side of things is that I've identified using the whole genome screen a number of different genes that are involved in flagellar function and keratin degradation that show differential expression when we compare life stages and that represent really exciting targets for further study in trying to understand the pathogenicity of BD. So let's look at things from the other perspective. This is the experimental design for an experiment that I did with Zenith in the lab, where I used healthy and sick frogs that had undergone an experimental infection protocol and looked at their gene expression patterns, again, at every gene in the Xenophis genome, at several different time points of infection, and at several different tissues. So I'm interested in the liver because it has important immune function in, um, in frogs, and I'm interested in the skin because that's the actual site of infection. And I wanted to just highlight some of the results, again, not giving you an exhaustive list of genes that are differentially expressed, but telling you about some of the exciting next steps to follow up with. I'm showing you uh, arrows that tell you the direction of gene expression change. So if there's an up arrow, that means the gene is more highly expressed in sick frogs. If there's a down arrow, that gene is, uh, is, shows lower levels of expression in sick frogs. So the first thing that was really exciting is that I see a large number of genes involved in immune function that are perturbed in sick frogs. MHC, immunoglobins, corticosteroids, toll receptors, um, complement. And this whole, thing, this whole category of immune function genes is of extreme interest because it's been really difficult over the last number of years to figure out exactly what kind of immune response frogs are um, initiating in response to BD. And so this work dovetails really nicely to work going on in immunological labs like Louise Rollins Smith, where they're trying to understand at the immunological level what's happening. And here I'm going to be able to provide some candidates for specific mechanisms underlying some of the immunological findings from other labs. And I'll give you just a couple of examples of those. One are these genes that encode uh, proteins involved in the complement system. So complement are, small, are composed of small proteins found in the blood. And it's been shown that, these, uh, that if you infect frogs with BD and then borrow uh, their antibodies and put them back on BD grown in lab conditions, it actually will inhibit BD growth. And that this process is complement dependent. 
So here we can go from that observation at the organismal level all the way back down to specific genes that are perturbed in sick frogs. Another really interesting um, uh, target for future study are these toll receptors that are known to be involved in antimicrobial immunity. And in fact, there's some recent studies that suggest toll-like receptors in vertebrates can identify, can particularly identify chitin, which is what the BD cell wall is made of. So I just kind of want to give you a general sense of how we can flow through a bunch of different levels of analysis and that the mechanistic um, work is not just hung out to dry someplace, but it really connects back to observations that people are making at the organismal level. And then finally, the last uh, target I wanted to mention in the liver is that I'm seeing a whole lot of genes involved in iron regulation perturbed in sick frogs. And this is something also that's been talked about in the human literature, that if you can starve um, microbes of environmental iron, you actually can inhibit their ability um, to be pathogenic. So from the skin point of view, there's actually a lot less going on. The skin is a site of a large immune response in frogs. But there are a number of genes that show decreased expression in sick frogs that have to do with cell death. And probably most interestingly, there's a large number of orthologs of human keratin genes that show decreased expression in sick frogs. And this is particularly interesting, because if you look, these aren't exactly at the same scale, but if you compare healthy and sick frog skin, you see that in sick and frogs that are infected with chytrid, you get this thickening and irregularity of the stratum corneum. And this is exactly what we see in humans that have an ailment called epidermolytic hyperkeratosis. And we see the similar thickening and irregularity of the same um, cell, uh, the same layer of the skin, and the human ailment is um, caused by deficiency in the exact same gene family that we're seeing down-regulated in sick frogs. And it actually causes a very similar phenotype in these kind of disgusting, pussy lesions. So what I told you from the frog point of view is that there are a large number of genes that are perturbed in sick frogs and that some of these are exciting because they provide um, mechanism for known effects of chytrid. For example, the disruption of keratin and the, um, the possible involvement in, of complement in an anti-BD immune response. But also exciting because they provide some clues about things that previously hadn't been talked about in terms of amphibian response to chytrid. For example, the possibility that, um, that post uh, that host regulation of iron homeostasis could have antimicrobial effects. What I hope that, um, that you can see is that by looking from both the host and the pathogen side simultaneously, we get a much more powerful um, effect of our inference because we can start seeing how complementary pathways are perturbed in that we see all of these keratin-related genes um, perturbed in frogs that might be um, involved in maintaining or compromising keratin integrity, and we see putative pathogenicity genes in chytrid that might be involved in degrading keratin. So obviously, this is a start, but it's not the be-all, end-all. And what is really exciting about this work is driving it back out into the field so that we can work on understanding host pathogen dynamics in a system we actually care about for ecological reasons. And that system, um, although there's many possibilities, the system that I'm excited about working on right now is that of Ronnie Muscosa, the mountain yellow-legged frog, Chris Colvin actually took this picture, who's here someplace. Um, and uh, although we currently have no genomic resources for Ron Muscosa, I'm right now um, working on sequencing the whole express genome of Ron Muscosa, the transcriptome, so that I can do similar assays in a frog that we care about, as I've shown you today with Xenopus. <coughs> And so I just want to highlight in my last couple of minutes um, the kinds of uh, the, the power of these tools when you can actually connect them back to real ecological data. And I'm very fortunate to be developing a collaboration with Vance Greenberg, Sherry Briggs, Roland Knapp, and Craig, who've been working on a system of the mountain yellow-legged frog uh, Vance for de over a decade now. Um, so it's, there's a phenomenal ecological resource to bring to bear on this question. And the observation that Vance has made is that this is the distribution of Ronomuscosa in the Sierra Nevada mountains. 
and that in fact different populations of Rana mucosa are exhibiting different outcomes to infection with BD. Some populations are getting hit and becoming extirpated, and some populations are getting hit and recovering. And so the question uh, that this group has set out to answer is how we can explain the differences in declining and persistent populations of Rana mucosa. And there's a number of different possibilities, including differences in future virulence, differences in frog susceptibility, differences in the environment, differences in demographic factors. And we're embarking on, um, on an ambitious project to really merge ecological experimentation with genomic assays to have the ecology tell us what's going on at the organismal level in terms of being able to measure um, pathogen loads and mortality, among other things, with the genomics hoping to add the angle of what might be going on mechanistically at the genome level. And so we're going to be looking at, um, at a number of different experimental crosses between frogs and chytrid from these de persistent and declining sites, and looking at these experiments under different um, den frog density conditions and under different environmental conditions, and hopefully then be able to have a sense, both from the organismal level and from the mechanistic level, what might be driving these different outcomes in different populations. So what I hope that I've given a sense of today um, is that these different paradigms, one embracing natural history and one embracing a much more mechanistic understanding of the world, in fact are not at odds at all, but can be interwoven really compelling, compelling ways to give us greater insight than we would get um, from one alone. And so I do hope that um, if, if for now we're here in 2008, looking forward to the next 100 years, that ecological genomics would at least play a part in the research program. And with that, I'd like to thank particularly collaborators. Um, Jason Steich was a fellow, uh, was a fellow postdoctoral um, scholar here at Berkeley. Mike Eisen, who is my postdoc advisor at the Joint Genome Institute, collaborated with us on sequencing the BD genome. Vance, Sherry, Roland, and Craig are pioneering the ecology work in Rana Muscosa. Had a number of great undergrads on this project, um, and would like to particularly thank uh, David and Craig and my husband Mike, who all have been supportive of me in above and beyond ways over the last number of years. So thank all of you.